Hey kids, this is Ivan, and today it's off to the races. I'm going to talk about the races that I use in my old school Dungeons & Dragons game. Now pretty much what I use are the races straight out of the first edition player's handbook with some tweaks. Um, I don't use the all the sub-races that are found in Unearthed Arcana. I figure if you want to play a different type of elf or a different type of dwarf, yeah, just say you're that type of elf or dwarf. We don't need mechanics for that. As far as like weird things like drow, I'll get to that near the end of this installment. Now, gnomes. Gnomes are the red-headed stepchild of first edition uh, Dungeons & Dragons. They're, you know, short dwarves with big noses that can cast illusions. Wow. Really appealing. Now, in Pathfinder, I found that they have this gnome character. It's completely retooled, and it's kind of like a halfling on acid. Uh, biggest of the fairy folk, and they're really kind of an appealing class or, or race. So, uh, I'll let you play either one of those, and in my game, I'll call them earth gnomes and fairy gnomes, or fey gnomes, or forest gnomes, or whatever you'd like. And uh, my shtick, if you will, is that uh, wherever gnomes lived over time, they became more and more like that area. And that even explains those gnomes, uh, the deep gnomes, which have a name that nobody can really pronounce, that live way underground. And that's why they're weird like that, because they live under there. Now, I don't use any kind of racial minimums or maxims. Um, and I use the ability modifiers uh, in first edition with a bit of a tweak because of that. Just uh, that you can't be under 3 or over 18, even if you the ability score modifier would put you there based on your race. Now, I'm not completely heartless, so like, let's say if you're playing a half-orc and you have supposed to get a plus 1 of strength and a plus 1 of constitution, and you roll an 18 strength and you've got a 15 constitution, I'll let you put those two points in con constitution. I'm not completely heartless. Um, now, you lost in first edition, if you were to add up all the bonuses, uh, the racial modifiers, they equal out to zero. They give you a plus one in one ability, they also give you a negative one in another ability. And now in Pathfinder, they give you a plus two to two abilities and a negative two to one ability, so you end up with a net bonus all the told of plus two. I figured I'd go for the middle road and give you a net bonus of plus one. I liked what Pathfinder did a little bit because they gave you pluses in two different abilities. So like in first edition, if you were an elf, you're supposed to get a plus to dexterity and a negative to constitution. But in Pathfinder, they also give you a plus to intelligence, which to me is very elfy. So I like that. So I incorporate that sort of thing. So the bottom line is races get, um, dwarves get a plus one to constitution and a negative one to charisma, but I also give them a plus one for wisdom. Elves get a plus one to dexterity and a negative one to constitution, but I also give them a plus one to intelligence. Gnomes normally don't get any modifiers, so I decided to go with the truncated modifiers from Pathfinder. So regardless of what type you are, you get a negative one to strength, a plus one to constitution, and a plus one to charisma. Uh, Half-elves get a plus one to any ability score they'd like. Throw them a bone. Halflings get a negative one to strength and a, negative, a plus one to dex, but I also give them a plus one to charisma, because they're likable. Uh, Half-orcs get the standard plus one to strength and uh, plus one to con and a negative two to charisma. No bonus really for them. And humans also get thrown a bone and get a plus one to the ability score of their choice. Now there is a bit of an issue with charisma. In first edition, dwarves and half-orcs had a negative to their charisma score, which modified the reactions of people to them, the number of henchmen they could have, all that kind of thing, except when it came to members of their own race, in which case they were supposed to keep their original charisma score, and then if should they meet uh, or try to hire dwarves or half-orcs, then they use the old charisma score. And I let them do that because that's fair. Uh, the other thing that I had to uh, address was that I used the save motif from Castles and Crusades where all six ability scores actually modify your saves. So charisma in that um, motif would uh, modify death magic, death magic, charm, and fear. And, you know, I'm in the camp that thinks charisma is all force of will and uh, personality. So for me, I let the half-orcs and the dwarves keep their old charisma score just uh, for also for modifying that save. And even though first edition has, doesn't have any sort of mechanic for intimidation, I use the reaction tables, so the BX reaction tables, and uh, I'll just let you apply your charisma modifier to that. So I let the half orcs and dwarves keep their old uh, score for that purpose as well. Now on the subject of saving throws, uh, which is its own installment, I don't use that standard first edition modifier where dwarves, gnomes, and halflings get a plus one to saves versus magic for every 3.5 uh, points of constitution they have. And likewise, I don't do that same thing for dwarves and hobbits that have the same thing for saves versus poison. Instead, I give those races a flat plus two save versus magic and a plus two versus poison for dwarves and uh, hobbits and just make up the difference with the modifiers from the various ability scores. And it comes out to be pretty darn close. 
um, the uh, little fairy gnomes actually get a little plus to not to magic but to illusion magic which is kind of neat and that's a little holdover from Pathfinder so what else can they do um, elves still get the standard uh, first edition stuff they get 90 percent resistance to sleep and charm plus one to hit on bows and swords Infravision. they can detect secret and can see doors easier they're able to move really silently and surprise folk uh, on their own a lot easier Dwarves get the introvision, they get percentage chance of noticing all kinds of stonework stuff. They get plus one to hit all the goblinoid and orc type races. They get four better on their armor class when attacked by giant sized humanoids. And I also like the idea from Pathfinder that their base move really doesn't change until they're fully encumbered. I think that's a neat mechanic. Gnomes, two types, they all get information, they all get four better on armor class versus giant sized humanoids, and plus one to hit kobolds because they don't like kobolds. The Earth Gnomes get the standard stonework mojo like the dwarves where they can detect stuff and can speak with burrowing mammals, while the forest type can cast a simple illusionist cantrip once a day or speak with animals once per day, regardless of their class. And they also, also tend to be liked by most fairy creatures. Half elves get the infravision, 30% resistance to charm and magic, uh, or, or charm type spells, uh, and sleep rather, um, and the same detection skills that elves do for the rest of the uh, hidden dwarves and hidden stuff. Half works well, they, they get infravision. Uh, hobbits get in provision, some underground, underground mojo, the stealth and surprise stuff that the elves get. And I also give them a bit of an armor class bone benefit against really giant humanoids. Not quite as big as for dwarves or gnomes. As far as languages, I do it makes sense in the campaign. I don't necessarily go by the book. So, you know, they'll speak common, they'll speak their racial language, and if it makes sense for them to be able to speak some other kind of language, I'll throw that in. Um, I also use a first edition player's handbook, uh, Thief uh, Skill Modifiers for the races. But I've been kind of looking into retooling those a little bit. Lifespans, you know, I vary from campaign to campaign, you know, what makes sense for me then. As far as racial skills, I don't use skills as such, but uh, I do more of an intuitive racial knowledge sort of thing. Um, there's just some things you know how to do because you're a dwarf or an elf. And there's other things you might have a better chance than everybody else. There's not really a set mechanic. But, you know, it's not written in stone, but say you're a forest gnome or an elf. You know, you're going to have a better chance of uh, being able to find something to eat in the wood, you know, twigs and berries and all that kind of crap than other uh, other races would. And uh, as far as odd races are concerned, drow, you know, all that weird stuff, you want to play a hobgoblin stuff, I, I do stuff that makes sense in the campaign. You, you know, sometimes it's fun to play an all-goblinoid campaign or whatever, um, or, you know, a campaign of evil characters or evil races or underwater things. But for the most part, I try to stay away from that. Um, my big rules are really that it makes sense in the campaign and that you're not going to play an overpowered character. Things like half, you know, half ogres, they're, they're off the table, or bugbears. No, you're, you're playing that because you want to be big and strong. And so no dice, you know, no magic resistant things and all that kind of stuff. You're going to have plenty of chances to play an odd race when some druid reincarnates your dead self. And next thing you know, you're a bugbear or God knows what. I do like the idea of being reincarnated as some kind of a anthropomorphized version of an animal. Uh, so the idea of a druid uh, reincarnating you and you become this uh, rather tall badger that stands upright on two hind legs and, and is really good at thief skills, that's kind of entertaining. I, I like that little thing. Some guy brought that up in a forum. I'm using that. Now, on the subject of classes, this is the most controversial thing I do. I don't use racial level limits, and I don't limit what classes you can play for the most part, depending on what your race is, unless a particular campaign has some kind of flavor thing where dwarves can't be magicians or whatever. Um, I understand this is controversial, um, but uh, you know, I even use a one-size-fits-all multi-classing thing for some people. Um, I understand why people get upset about that, but uh, you know, I didn't like those rules back in 1981, and I don't like them now. So I let you play whatever class you'd like. Um, I don't necessarily see the extra goodies that the races get as being all that influential or advantageous in mid to high level play. So you know. While it's sure, at low level, it's really helpful to have all the extra little racial skills and modifiers and stuff like that. There's not a heck of a lot of difference between a 10th level wizard and a 10th level wizard that can see in the dark and notice secret doors a little better. There really isn't, so I don't see the need for those racial level limits. Now, some people would argue that removing all those limitations turn the races into humans that are just dressed up in elf suits. I got news for you. That's what they are now. We're people pretending to be elves. When I was a little kid, way before I learned uh, or even heard of how to play Dungeons & Dragons, I used to run around in my yard and pretend, I'm an elf, I'm an elf, I'm an elf, I'm a hobbit, I'm doing all these cool things. And you know what, kids? That's what I do now. 